I'm going to call the meeting of the Oskaloosa City Council to order. Today is May 5th, 2014. If we could start with the invocation by Pastor Rodney Durandi, uh, Fellowship Bible Church. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you and up front acknowledge that uh, you're in control, that you're sovereign, and uh, but in that you're still loving, you're fair, you're good, you're just, and um, you rule over all. And you created us, you made us. So we pray, and we pray for, well, we thank you for uh, our policemen, our firefighters, Lord, our street crews, and just all the work that they do, and so that's that you keep them safe. Um, Lord, we pray for our farmers. It's a great time of year, but uh, keep them safe as they get in the fields, and we pray for, I guess, your will to be done in harvest. Ultimately, you, you again, send the rain and the sunshine. Um, you make it happen, but we just, we pray for safety for them. Lord, we pray for um, the Sikafu's family, for Tyler, and ask, uh, if, I guess, up to us, Lord, we would just pray for full healing, restore him, Lord, but uh, if that's not your plan, your will, Lord, we ask for your grace on that family to, to get through a, maybe a long, tough season, but we commit them to you. Lord, we thank you for our teachers and our students, for our kids, our youth. Lord, as they come in the last month, the last weeks of the school year, help them to finish well, uh, to finish strong, uh, to learn lots, and them to keep them safe, and for a good, safe summer and all the activities of travel and, and uh, just... Uh, rest we pray to so many good things that you give us thank you for the, to allowing us to live in Oskaloosa a community like this we have so many good things thank you for our leaders for our authorities that your word says you give to us you give them authority and power to rule pray for wisdom uh, and all the big and small decisions uh, that your hand would be on them Lord again thank you for them and just bless this time we pray in Jesus name amen amen thank you pastor Charlie Yes. Would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Caligari? Here. Geminis? Here. Moore? Here. Benzetton? Yes. First day? Here. Walling? Here. Gates? Here. Okay, thank you. Next item uh, on the agenda is the community comments time. Uh, this item is reserved to receive comments from the community for concerns whether or not they're included on the current agenda. Uh, the community is encouraged to come and speak before the mayor and city council, asked to keep statements brief. Any questions are to be asked of the city staff, council members, or the mayor uh, prior to speaking to the full council. And that's so concerns can be properly researched and answered perhaps away from the meeting. Uh, comments are to be directed to the mayor and city council only. Is there anyone who would care to speak at this time? Okay. Name and address, please. Uh, Ann Whitus, 152 Highland, Oskaloosa. Okay. Okay. Um, I am approaching the city council, first as a member of the community, second as a parent who has raised three children, two of them in medical training who I'd like to attract back to Oskaloosa, and thirdly as a physician who has provided medical care in this community for 25 years. As a member of this community, I'm tired of watching others retire to greener pastures. We have all seen the migration of longtime Oskaloosans to West Des Moines, Texas, Florida, and other areas. Why do people leave our community for other areas? Well, I don't think we can compete with the weather in some of those areas, but I expect some move because of the amenities other communities have that Oskaloosa doesn't. The Blue Zones Project offers Oskaloosa a comprehensive way to improve our lives that touches on everything in our community, from how we choose to eat, to how we choose to get from point A to point B, to how do we choose to spend our free time, which all impacts how we feel about living here and hopefully how long we get to live here. As parents, we want what is best for our children. Most children don't get near enough physical activity. Sure, many play sports, participate in PE, but what they are missing is the in-between activity, the walking, the biking, the just being active. Let's make Oskaloosa a better town for kids and adults to get around by means other than automobiles. As we try to recruit professionals, including physicians, to Oskaloosa, I can't think of a better recruitment tool than to be a Blue Zone. This will make Oskaloosa stand out as a place where we value our quality of life so much 
that we are willing and able to create an environment that promotes healthy behaviors. As a physician, I can tell you that health behaviors are extremely hard to change. Most everyone here has been on a diet or made a New Year's resolution that lasts for a short while and then we fall off. Many people have tried multiple times to quit smoking. Our bodies and minds seem programmed to make bad choices. And we live in an environment where bad choices are everywhere. The proven and scientifically validated method to improve the health of individuals and populations is to change the environment that we live in. Now, before we get all hyped up and paranoid about Big Brother and don't tread on me and it's my constitutional right to eat French fries, settle down, relax, check your blood pressure. Um, nothing about Blue Zones Project has anything to do about eliminating choices. It's all about expanding them. It promotes healthy behaviors over unhealthy behaviors, but does not take anything away. It raises awareness and increases opportunities to make healthy choices. It lets people who want to be healthier vote with our wallets when we go out to eat, when we buy food at the grocery store. It will have an impact on our choice to raise our families in Oskaloosa, our choice of who we want to work for. I believe our government is responsible for setting policy that affects public safety and public health. That's why we have police departments, fire departments, the Department of Public Health. We have laws telling us to wear seat belts, laws that make this room smoke free, laws that list the ingredients and how many calories are in the foods we buy. I am sure tobacco companies would love to sell cigarettes in our schools, but there are laws against that. For the first time in our history, we face the prospect that our children's lifespans will be less than ours. Despite all the wonderful medical technology, advances in medications, and everything, it looks like chronic disease will kill the next generation of children at an earlier age. If that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. It's our environment that's killing us. We have the opportunity to change that, and we have an obligation to do so. Thanks. Thank you. I'm Shirley Fry, 316 Kioma Village. So I'm not part of, of your constituency. I'm out of the city limits, but <clears throat> very interested nonetheless in all that Oskaloosa offers. I'm a volunteer with the Ecumenical Cupboard, which as you probably know, serves people in poverty, people that are often excluded from the opportunities that most of us find just right there for us. So I'm happy to let you know that at the cupboard, we will be putting things out to be specifically about the Blue Zones project for probably the next year, maybe even longer than that. The folks that come to the ecumenical cupboard are not people that have access to the newspaper necessarily or would read it if they did if they did find themselves somewhere where it was available but they are used to picking up free things at the cupboard and it will be very easy for me using the blue zones project materials to put a little slip a colored piece of paper that has one idea or maybe two about making healthier choices and being healthier people. <clears throat> These folks are often the people that make the emergency room their primary care provider. And so prevention, preventative measures are very important for them, as they are for all of us. But these folks have fewer resources. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the Blue Zone, and I do want you to know that the Ecumenical Cupboard will be a place that will provide some education for the Blue Zone project. Thank you. Thank you.
I have some handouts if I may give them to the city council. Uh, certainly, and also lift up that microphone when, oh, when you get back there. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Walter Tippett. I live at 2651 Luminary Lane in Oskaloosa. And my wife Pam and I own the property at 409 15th Avenue East, uh, at the corner of uh, 15th Avenue and South 4th Street. So we want to comment on the proposed parking ban on South 4th Street. <clears throat> um, this parking ban would create a problem for us. Um, we need the parking. We own the we own the house. It's a it's a rental property, and the folks that own the property on the opposite corner who are also here um, would, would have a problem too if there's no parking on that on that street on South 4th Street. This, um, this whole issue started with a letter from Mr. Applegate that owns Precision Yield on the corner of South 4th and 13th. The letter is the first attachment there. And in his opinion, the parking is a problem on South 4th. He mentions uh, that he has 40 to 50 semis that come there per year to deliver uh, his inventory. And some of them take South 4th Street. Also that there are smaller trailers, basically pickup trucks with fifth wheel trailers that are used to deliver his materials on South 4th Street. Um, he mentions there in the letter that there's constant truck and bus traffic on there, but that's not really accurate. Uh, there are occasional trucks that go through there, through South 4th, that cut through. Uh, it's kind of a shortcut. And there are buses certain times of the day, Monday through Friday during the school year, that go there going back and forth to the bus barn. But in reality, uh, parking on that street is, is only a minor inconvenience for folks like Mr. Applegate that have a business there. Uh, we can't see how there's any tangible effect on the success of his business, um, his profitability, or any, or his ability to grow his business, or anything. And we feel that it's it's something that he wants, not something that he needs. But for us, it's a bigger deal because we need the parking there, uh, and it's not just an occasional inconvenience, but it's every every evening and 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 during the night, every day of the year, that that parking is needed. So there's a map there, it's the second handout, that just kind of shows the, an overview, kind of a top view of the neighborhood. And uh, in the lower left corner is the house that we own on, on the corner of 4th and 15th. Uh, Mr., uh, the, the letter that I'm referring to um, make, makes reference to ABC Metals and, and Veenstra's Trucking and Pamco, as well as the bus barn. And you can see that some of those are actually closer to 7th Street. And uh, um, the, only, the only business that actually does receiving on South 4th using trucks is Tim Sparks' drywall business. Mr. Sparks, in answering the questionnaire on this issue, said that he saw no problem whatsoever and that he would recommend no change to the parking that's on both sides of the street there. The other all the other businesses, including Precision Yield, do their receiving on 13th. And um, 13th Street, 13th Avenue, and 7th Street are bigger streets that are more up to the task of truck traffic than, than 4th Street is. Um, like I said, 4th Street is really just a shortcut, and these businesses could get along just fine, actually, if there was no truck traffic at all on 4th Street there would really be no measurable impact on those businesses. Um, actually, 4th Street is used by trucks only to go onto 15th Avenue to the west. Going to the east, it makes more sense for them to use 7th, and that's what they do. And um, so there's really two scenarios. Vehicles wanting to go east are coming from the east on 15th Avenue and using 4th Street. Uh, vehicles going out, if they're large vehicles, you can see in the third handout there, a school bus going out. Now, the school bus is used in the middle of the street. And 
the reason they use the middle of the street is because they're turning right onto 15th and they need to be over there in order to make that turn. They can't stay in the right hand lane and make the turn onto 15th into the near lane on 15th. So, um, in other words, eliminating the parking, this is really not a parking issue at all for this scenario um, because they need to use the middle of the street anyway. And if a vehicle wants to turn in there, they just have to wait, just like on any other intersection. So, what about uh, the other scenario when vehicles, large vehicles like buses or trucks are trying to turn into South Forth from coming from the west on 15th? Well, they can make the turn because it's a bigger radius coming across the lane to turn into 4th Street. And it's really no worse than any other street. South 2nd Street is basically a clone of South 4th Street, just down the hill, two blocks over, there's no difference in the intersection. It's a T intersection going into 15th with the same traffic flow. And the width of the curb opening into the street is the same, it's 28 feet. There's parking allowed on both sides of that street. And Clow, Clow's shipping department is on 2nd Street. I went by there today, there's six big overhead doors where all the finished goods come out, the big loads of fire hydrants and valves and things that they ship. Where do they go? down 2nd Street or up 2nd Street. Where do the empty trucks come to go pick up a load? They come right up 2nd Street. It's no different from 4th Street. And there's no problem there. There never has been a problem there on South 2nd Street. So um, we feel that there should be no need for restrictions on South 4th either. Um, if, if a large vehicle is trying to turn in there, and another is trying to leave, one just has to wait momentarily. It happens all over town right now where trucks have to, when trucks are trying to turn, somebody has to just pause and use some courtesy and cooperation to get around town. So in, in the fourth picture there, you can see that actually on 4th Street, there's more room than on 2nd Street because on 2nd Street, there's a, there are curbs just like most of the streets. Seventh is the same way. And there's 28 feet between the curbs. On South 4th, just off the edge of the, of the white car, the fender of the white car is the curb. You can see that car is parked mostly off the street. The, the, the width, the overall width of that street, including the areas, the little aprons where the cars park on both sides is about 35 feet. Compared to Second Street, that's only 28 feet. So 4th Street, in other words, is less of an issue width-wise than South 2nd Street. So you know, we feel that this doesn't justify going to the extreme of an ordinance to take care of this issue, to prohibit the parking. It might add minor convenience to some that want to travel through there with a truck. It has no measurable effect on anybody's business, but has a clear detrimental effect on our business, uh, on who we can rent to, even prop the value of our property, as well as our neighbor across the street. And we've already taken steps to try to relieve any concerns here by asking our tenants on both sides of the street to park away from the corner. And, and that's what we've done. And, and we've been out there, we spent a lot of time out there um, working on our property and so forth. We've never seen issues there, like it was described in the letter that, that voices the concern. So. We, we actually feel that this matter should be dropped. Um, my wife Pam has some, some other comments she'd like to make regarding this. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, can I just a quick question? How deep is, is your property there? You mean off the street? Yeah, no, just how from, from north to, to south. North to south, yeah. North to south? Well, if you, I guess the best way to look at it is on that second hand out there. Is that um, letter A? You can Are see you on page A? Is page right? two. two. Page two, okay. sorry. Okay. And I can look it up if you don't know it. I just thought you might. Yeah. No, I guess the, uh, the depth, I don't know okay. offhand. I can't uh, answer I'd say. that somewhat. Um, Go ahead. My name is Pam Tippett. I live the same place he does, <laughs> out on Luminary Lane. Um, when 
um, this matter first came up at the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, one of the things that I assured them at that point in time was that we would talk to our tenants and I would talk to my neighbors about having those who are parking there to um, move back from the stop sign. Um, the legal requirement is 10 feet from the stop sign. At the back corner of my house there is about 60 feet off of the stop sign. And my tenant now kind of uses that as his, uh, where he parks behind there. Our tenant's on the other side. Um, we talked to him uh, just a couple of hours ago. His children use, as you, if you can see, on handout A, um, off the back of his house, there's a little patio there. They park from there on back. Uh, away from the, so there's 60 to 70 feet there from the stop sign. I'm a woman driver. I drive a pickup truck with an 18 foot trailer and all of my equipment on it when I mow and take care of this property. And even I can get around that corner <laughs> in 60 to 70 feet. So um, I believe that where the current parking is, uh, does not truly constitute a hazard. Perhaps in the winter time, uh, when the snow accumulates and the street does narrow up at some point, there may be, uh, and, and, I, and I am just hazarding a guess here because the letter, uh, the date on the letter that expresses the complaint was February. And this issue came up to the Planning and Zoning Commission in March. But when I went to the Planning and Zoning uh, meetings, the first one in March, uh, one of the commissioners asked the representative of the engineer's office, have there been any accidents there? His answer was no. And after the discussion by Planning and Zoning, they arrived at the conclusion that what congestion was there most of the time was not a result of the parking, but as a result of the increased traffic and the size of the vehicles that are using the street. And a vote was called for and an on um, the ordinance eliminating the parking and planning and zoning declined to call for such an ordinance at that time. In an attempt to address the true cause of the congestion, planning and zoning offered the solution of a one way on South 4th so that everyone could continue to use the street. And the engineer's office said that another survey would be needed uh, on that proposal. The survey was made, and the results brought to the planning and zoning meeting, the next planning and zoning meeting, at which I attended. And planning and zoning, after reviewing the results of the survey and hearing further discussion, Actually, some of the commissioners went there and observed at that intersection themselves from time to time. And again, by vote, they declined to eliminate, they declined to eliminate the parking there. Specifically, one of the commissioners asked if those objecting to the one way in the survey had been notified and asked to participate in this meeting. A representative of the engineer's office said indeed they had been invited, but they had declined. And as my husband said, we feel like uh, we've gone above and beyond uh, what the law requires uh, so that we don't contribute to an ongoing problem there. But, um, and even the survey uh, by Mr. Sparks indicated that he didn't think it was, it wasn't going to result in an inconvenience for him too. But you might be wondering why a recommendation to restrict the parking didn't get past planning and zoning. And that is in part because of the discussion and the concerns that, that I had that would happen if you did eliminate the parking on South Forth. Where would our tenants park? Well, if you look at um, initial, the initial map there marked A in your handouts, you can see that there is a really short distance from the end of our driveways to the intersection of South Forth. From my driveway, it's, less, it's about 50 feet. From the other driveway on the other side of the street, it's less than 25 feet. 
If you eliminate parking and all of our vehicles go into the driveway, uh, the driveways are 36 feet. And the average vehicle is 15 to 18 feet. If you stack them up bumper to bumper in our driveways, then you will be creating the scenario in the handout of these pictures here that is marked A. This first picture, I'm sitting in my car at the intersection of South 4th and 15th and looking west. That truck that you see there is in the end of my driveway. As you can see, it's pretty, there's an, another, in the second picture, there's a vehicle in front of it. And you can see that the view to that, to the west there, is blocked. You have to advance into the intersection in order to see past that vehicle. Essentially, you are creating the scenario on both sides of that street of a tunnel because of the parked, clock, uh, parked cars there with a blind corner. In the next, in the next handout there, um, you can see how far, um, actually there's a at the top picture, I am pulled out past the stop sign. There is a telephone pole. I looked to my right, saw the truck there, attempted to take a picture, and that's how close he was to me by the time I could even snap a picture. The bottom picture is how far out in front of the stop sign I was when I took the picture above it. Considerably far out there. So. As you can tell, the, in the other scenario, on the other side of the street, that distance, that gap is even shorter. If you pull up there and roll out past into the intersection, it is less than one second from the time you can see a vehicle past those parked cars to the west and less than a half of a second before you can see a ve an oncoming vehicle coming from the east. In my opinion, that hazard is much greater than any other hazard that may be there uh, now. And it will be created if we don't have any other parking. I think that, I believe, personally, that is a disaster in the making. So just to conclude our, our position, we. Um we were there today when the school buses were coming back to the bus barn. The neighbor across the street had his vehicle parked 70, about 75 feet from the intersection on the east side of 4th, 75 feet off of 15th. And we had a car parked where this photo shows in, in uh, this uh, handout number four. And the buses were able to wheel in there. They didn't even slow down. They just came right around the corner from come heading east on 15th, whipped around the corner and there's all kinds of room. And a semi would have all kinds of room there too. So we just feel this, that we don't know how this, why the, the whole thing got started, but we just feel it's, it's not, it doesn't warrant any, any kind of action because it's just a matter, it's no different from any other intersection where there's occasional truck or, or bus traffic in, in the city where people get along and cooperate and, and uh, coordinate their driving. So. One, one comment you just made there, Walt, well, we considered at last meeting was to only have park, no parking so far back to the curb. And so you're saying if, if, we, if we did something 60 to 75 feet, and that was why I was asking the depth of your property, then we'd create room and we would then allow room for you to have somebody to park at the, the northern side, right? So we could look at that. Yeah, to, you could to look solve at that. both things, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and to help everything. Yeah, I think that would be another option. You know, okay. if, if if it's felt that there needs to be some action taken, that if there were parking restricted a certain distance from the curb, that would, um, you know, that would be something. I don't, I don't know that it's even necessary, but but in parking sixty to seventy feet, that's even more than needed. You know, frankly. But I mean, so, and, and that's, again, I yeah. don't know the exact amount, but. That's why I was asking that question. Yeah. I go that way a lot. I have one of the buildings that I disclosed yeah. last week, and yeah. and I'm over there almost every day. And there are issues, and I've seen them and dealt with them. And and 
I'm happy to abstain from the vote too, but I'm just trying to figure out how we could work a solution for the buses, for the trucks, as well as the people using that, that road. That would be an option. Okay. One thing that I, that I can say that, um, that I can speak to, um, that one of my tenants uses the driveway and the other one parks on the right of way kind of off to the side there on the west side of the street. My neighbor on the other side, on the other hand, has um, two teenage children that uh, essentially are not there during the day when they're in school. And the parking is primarily used in the evening hours and I would say you know, prior to school hours in the morning. If you put three vehicles from the back of my house there, just on the west side, um, I'm not sure you can get three vehicles in there. That um, wasn't going to limit on either side, just but move it back from the curb on both sides. Oh, back from uh, yeah, just back on from, both sides. Yeah, fifteenth on yeah, that's what right. I, I I don't see at all why that would be okay. a problem. As a matter of fact, I asked at the last planning and zoning commission meeting because we did this at the first one if there had been any feedback. Um, since we had had the parking moved back and um, the engineer's office hadn't received any feedback at all from there. But, you know, at this point in time, I don't see why there would be a problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else care to speak? I'm Nancy Shipman. My husband and I own the other property on 15th. And I just have a concern. I feel that if the person who had the issue would have contacted us, you guys wouldn't have had to be involved. Whatever happened to that kind of a communicate with your neighbor. Just a thought. Does anyone else care to speak at this time? Okay, we'll move on. Item number five is the consent agenda. Um, things that are routine and generally non-controversial. Do we have a motion to pass the consent agenda? Second. Okay, any discussion? I have one question. Item G. Okay. Um, about disposal of surplus city owned equipment. Yep. Are we going to do any, like, city yard sale or something? <laughs> or we're going to be auctioning it off. Or okay. Just, if it's junk, we throw it away and oh, okay. we receive permission to do that. Okay. i got one question, Mayor. On the uh, fees, <coughs> I know last year we got it. It was, it was easy because it was red and black. But are the fees the same They're as the, last year? They're all the same. There, is no, same. there is no change. Correct. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Roll call, please. Moore? Yes. Ben Zetton? Yes. First day? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Caligiuri? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Okay. That passes. Um, item number six is the announcement of vacancies. Um, first is the Building Code Board of Appeals. We have two vacancies to fill. That's upon appointment and serve at the pleasure of the mayor. Uh, this is a five-member board that meets as needed, with currently three males serving uh, and two vacancies. And then also the water board, one vacancy to fill upon appointment to an unexpired term that ends on June 30th, 2018, and one vacancy for a six-year term that begins July 1, 2014, ends June 30th, 2020. It's a three-member board that typically meets the first Monday after the 10th of the month, two males currently serving, one vacancy. Okay. Moving on to the regular part of the agenda, um, I'm going to skip ahead to item B. I understand Mr. Ryman has another uh, obligation, and so with that in mind, uh, uh, this is to consider a resolution adopting a proposal for employee life insurance from National Insurance Services, health insurance from Sun Life Financial, with Wellmark as the administrator, and Classic Blue uh, PPO and Flex Plan administered by WageWorks, fiscal year 2015. Brad? 
Um, just quickly on the uh, table of contents, we're going to go through the ancillary coverages of the life, vision, dental, and the voluntary life, the flexible spending account, and then we'll go through the medical renewal. We will not go through the group history. We can always use that back for reference, which I assume most of you have been following throughout this process for the last couple of years, and then also the changes that are going to be required by the law. Okay? Um, quickly, the voluntary vision, the voluntary dental, the group term life and AD&D, &D, the group voluntary life renewal, and the flexible spending accounts, are, there's no change in the cost for those. So that's a no change in that, okay? Any questions on those coverages? The next one is the medical coverage. Um, for those of you, I think pretty much everybody looks real familiar here, so we've gone through this process three or four times. But the bottom line on the renewal is, is really breaking down into four categories. First of all, the annual administration fees. As you recall, back in November, first administrators decided to dissolve and move all their business over to Wellmark Blue Cross Blue Shield. They agreed on the administration costs until on all their groups that they had with first anything that moved to Wellmark, they were gonna keep all their costs fixed until their upcoming renewal. Uh, City of Oskaloosa's renewal is July 1st, so they held those rates and from November, for, uh, yeah, from November 1st, we'll hold those till July 1st. But effective um, uh, January 1st of 2014, the fixed costs are gonna go up 12.54 12.54%. The majority of it's coming from what they call, if you look at the network access fee, majority of it's coming from the blue card. And one of the things that you did not have before is you had a, didn't have an out of network benefit, but now you have an out of network benefit, but Blue Cross Blue Shield and FAI agreed they wouldn't change anything. So because now you have an out of network benefit, which is called the blue card, your employee, the employees of the city, can also travel outside the, the state of Iowa and have an in-network benefit for them as well. So it'd be like if they were in the network and had the same kind of benefit, which is a good thing for the city because you're gonna continue to get the same kind of discount from your claim as you were getting back here in Iowa. So that's a plus, even though you look at it from a $4.95 to a $6.95, that seems like a significant jump, but in the long term, you just take one person out of state to pay for that dollars down the road. So that's one of the major costs in there. The next thing is uh, the reinsurance coverages. Um, the biggest one on this one is we currently have an ongoing claim and we'll continue to go ongoing and pretty much that's what the increase on this is. There is, as I told uh, Mike and Amy, there's a, there is a little bit of uh, Patient Protection Act cost in there, but not as much as you think. Most of it's coming from an ongoing situation, okay? Um, one thing about the Sun Life that you have your reinsurance with, which is a good thing, they could have, a lot of carriers would have come in and said, you know what, we'll take you, we'll continue to take your, your plan, but we're going to put what they call laser onto this current employee, which means right now you have a $40,000 on each one of your employees. They could have came in and said, we're going to put 140,000 on that person. So that's an expense to the city. It's anything under the 140. So that's another thing about you've got Sun Life, which is a good reinsurance carrier that wouldn't happen. The same thing with Wellmark. We did go to Wellmark for an optional quote, and they were much higher. So we felt this was the best one. So the biggest change there is uh, what's happening there is going to be the ongoing claim. Uh, but if you add the fixed cost, uh, the administration, and the uh, reinsurance cost together is a 29.33% increase. Now the good news is that the aggregate factors didn't change. Very slightly point, and I asked why don't we just match it, but the underwriters got the exact number there, 0.22% increase. So those ag factors are really what the claims are that anything under the $40,000 specific would be the city's risk. So if you, if you were to put this into a fully insured world, because you're self-funded, if you were going to put it into a fully insured, insured world, he had a 5.99% increase. But it's just that fixed part in there that was, that was the biggest increase. Anybody have any questions on the renewal, on that portion? So the next page is the um, very fine print up there on the screen, but in your packets is just the, um, the history. 
I did do a little bit of year-to-date history for you here on the right side, that probably be the biggest one to look at, which I found was very interesting that in the, since 2007 slash 2008, your claims have never, never been this low. This is the lowest year you've had. If it stays on track to where it's at today, you'll have the lowest amount of claims you've had. So you've had a good year. It's just, just one incident that's really biting. And if you look at the uh, premium equivalent, it's about as close as you can get to wherever you, you haven't been any, that low in a long time. So um, for the kind of plan you have right now, very, 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 very rich. Yeah, these rates are very, 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 very good. So if I were to put it into full insurance. Any questions on the history? Please feel the free to review that if you have any questions, get back to Mike or Amy if you got any questions on it or now, anybody. The last thing I just want to mention that because of our uh, uh, Patient Protection Act, there's a few changes that got to happen effective Jul July 1st, 2014. We now have to have an open enrollment. Uh, May 19th to May 30th will allow each employee who's not currently insured on the plan, whether they're dependents, they can come on the plan, open enrollment. The other thing is there's no pre-existing condition. So if you do have somebody that that has a pre-existing condition, can come on the plan in May 19th through May 30th, effective July 1st. That's changing. So just be aware of there's a little bit more risks now. Um, you know, this is part of the part of the vote that came through that this is what is going to happen, and some of this will come, may come back, and you may take on some risks you weren't you were eliminating before because before you said no open enrollment unless you had an event, which is you were married or had a child, whatever you could come on the plan. But if you came on, you were subject to pre-existing condition. Those two items are no longer on the plan anymore. So just be aware of that's a risk the, the city is now taking on. Also, effective. Quick question. Yes. Is that an open enrollment that has to have? Period annually? Yes, service. it is an annual open enrollment. Okay. It is an annual open enrollment. This is the first time you've ever had an annual open enrollment. But it'll be every year. It will be every year. Mm -hmm. uh, the period, um, that may be a little bit flexible, but we'll give the employees enough notice and time. A lot of this has to do with me presenting to you, having the paperwork signed back to Wellmark, have them print the summary plan certificates, and then being time for the May 19th employee meeting so that we can give it to us. It's, a lot of it has to do that. We may even have it earlier next year. That may happen. But okay. there's going to be a period here that everybody's going to have the opportunity, and they will be notified that there is one. Amy will let everybody know that. Okay, thank okay. you. Very good question. Uh, also, the, they're going to remove the $2 million annual maximum on essential health benefits. Now, those are listed right there um, are things that you have already, but uh, one of the ones is preventive and wellness services that now have to be covered. At, uh, at, since it can't be a $2 million, that's not going to happen. But anyway, so that now has to be t removed from the plan. Also, the law said that you could... Uh, you had to include your employees' dependents until age 26, but the law did say if you, they had coverage elsewhere, you, could, you couldn't allow them to come on. That's gone. You can't do that anymore. So they got coverage elsewhere, open enrollment. They can now come on if they're under the age of 26. All right? And then the last thing I just want everybody to know that effective to July 1st, this is your first time um, because of the way your renewal fell that you have to pay the PCORI fee, which is the dollar, per covered member per year. That's only a dollar. And I think it $170 is what it is per year. It's not the $5.25 that's been ongoing every month. You pay that $5.25 per covered member per month. So if you have a household of six, you're playing six times 5.25 times 12. Okay? This is just the dollar one time per year. Okay? And then there's another one, the annual health insurance fee you don't have to pay because you're self-funded. That's nine bucks. Here are a lot of employers who are fully insured, so that's one advantage of being self-funded. You can eliminate that nine dollars per covered member per month that you don't have to pay that. So that's all I had. Anybody got any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so in the explanation of the insurance, it mentions the current monthly premium charged to the city departments for single would be $483 uh, and 1162 for family. The city budgeted the same for fiscal year 2015 with 483 for single and 1162 for family. Uh, the suggested premiums stated here are 631 for single and 1607 for family. 
which means the city may be uh, using accumulated fund balance to make up the difference, as this change represents a 29% increase. Uh, staff has recommended the review of the plans and approval of the employee life insurance, health insurance, and the flex plan for fiscal year 2015. Uh, do we have a motion supporting that? So we'll take it. Nobody's smiling. Um, <laughs> it's insurance. <laughs> yeah. Discussion. Just when we say that, maybe it says down the budget consideration, how much of the fund balance will that be using? It just Compared depends on how many claims we have. We have plenty of fund balance, but what we, what we, where we've been is about 65 to 70 percent of claims. So the 903 is if worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. And we've been approximately 65 to 70 percent of that. Be on the safe side. I'd say 70. Just to, 70. That okay. would be. So we don't anticipate a significant decrease in the fund balance that we have. In fact, year over year, it's either grown or it's it's been flat. So we're in a healthy position as far as the fund balance goes. Okay. But if it did go 100 percent, there's not enough there. But it never goes 100 percent. Oh, if, yeah. if it went 100 percent, we'd be fine. Okay. We, we would just be using fund balance, so then we'd be adjusting at a budget next time, probably looking at raising the premiums. Next was 820,000 of fund balance yeah. there. So. And, and we're up from last year about 34000 in the fund balance at the same time. Okay. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Ben Zetton? Yes. Versteg? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Calajari? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Okay, that passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, I'm going to take us back to uh, item 7A. Uh, this is the one having to do with the South Central Regional Airport Agency. Uh, Chairman Jim Hansen uh, is to be here to present to the provider a uh, project update and review on the efforts made to date by the SCRAA board to complete the studies necessary to evaluate the potential siting of regional airport project in Mahaska County, located between Oskaloosa and Pella. Also an updated timeline. The floor is yours, Jim. <laughs> I don't I don't have the luxury of PowerPoints. Thank you. <laughs> I am Jim Hansen. I'm uh, chair of the South Central Regional Airport Agency and one of your appointees to that board. Uh, the agency was formed now two years ago. Uh, hard to believe that that's gone by, but two years ago, by way of a 28E agreement between the cities of Oskaloosa and Pella, as well as Mahaska County. And... Uh, purpose of the, uh, the agreement was to develop, uh, build, and run a regional airport somewhere along 163 in uh, Mahaska County. So uh, what I want to talk about tonight is where we've been and uh, where we are and where we hope to go, and I hope not to take too much of your time. Um, currently, Phase one is estimated to cost approximately 24 to 30 million dollars. Uh, FAA grant funds will pay up to 90 percent of what are called the non-vertical or flat costs of that. The costs of the FBO and the terminals and uh, the the hangars and other things will be split between Pella and Oskaloosa. Right now, I think the. Uh, Slide says that the primary runway is uh, thought to be, at this point, 5,500 feet. Uh, we now anticipate that it will be built to 6,500 feet with the potential of expanding it to 7,000. Uh, there will be a terminal building. Uh, by the way, we had a meeting with uh, airport users in Pella, uh, I'd say two, three weeks ago. Uh, where several, I think there was probably uh, 25 to 30 pilots came to talk about the terminal as, and the uh, uh, hangars and so forth. Very good meeting with them. They were very interested in the project, offered, offered good criticism as well as good commentary about the, about the project. Uh, and the site will be capable of providing a precision landing approach. Um, 
the the demand for this airport stems from the safety issues at the Pella Airport uh, and in handling uh, larger airplanes. And you can see those those pictures. These are going to be Class C aircraft, uh, which are fairly heavy and fairly fairly big. And that's what this thing is being being proposed to do. We anticipate. Um, up to 60 or more uh, airplanes hangered at the airport uh, when it opens. Uh, it could be expanded uh, for use of up to 100 aircraft of various sizes and so forth. So we're, uh, there's definitely a need out there for the airport and uh, something we're planning on. The next slide, which I'm sure Mike will show you, is uh, the planning area that was set. Uh, in the 2080 agreement, it was within 10 miles of each city as well as four miles off of 163. So that's the area within which we were to locate this airport. Uh, at that time, uh, we, it was actually our, our consultant, Jerry Searle, who many of you have either met or seen, um, came up with nine potential sites uh, in that area some a lot better than others, uh, and the board uh, narrowed that down to three, which were the sites A, B, and C, which were discussed uh, at length at various public meetings and so forth. Uh, we set up a site selection committee within the board, uh, weighed 30-some factors <coughs> affecting uh, uh, each site, <coughs> and uh, came down that site A was our preferred site, and that's the site that's located uh, closest to Oskaloosa. You can see, that's hard to see on that one. We'll, we'll go to the, the slide at the end a little bit, and I, uh, we'll talk about the site itself. Um, as I indicated back in October of 2012, we selected an engineering firm. Uh, our action plan was approved by the FAA in March of uh, last year. Uh, we selected Site A in uh, May of last year, and uh, we directed our consultant to put together an airport layout plan and a site selection report. Um, recently, we have also uh, met with seven of the nine landowners in Site A. Uh, those have been productive meetings. Uh, as I indicated, we had a users meeting in Pella, and in la late last month, uh, several of us met with FAA offic officials in Des Moines to discuss the process and, the, and how things are moving along. Uh, next steps. On this, we expect an airport layout plan to be completed by mid-July of this year and the master plan to be completed uh, in September. There'll be an environmental assessment that needs to be completed. These are all requirements of FAA regulations. Uh, along with that environmental assessment, there'll be a public hearing that's required uh, where people can come and talk about the uh, plan and the environmental impact of that plan. Uh, and all of that will be submitted uh, to the FAA by the end of the year, or sooner, hopefully. Uh, we hope at that point, uh, within, I can't remember exactly what the FAA told us, within four to six to eight weeks, uh, if they come back with an approval, uh, by first quarter of next year, we hope to begin uh, land acquisition. And we expect that that will take, uh, optimistically, we hope, two years to do. It'll be, uh, from that point, uh, we'll go two years, so into 2016 with land acquisition, uh, construction will go through 2017 through 2019 with the goal, I think, of opening this in 2020. Uh, we originally said 2021. We are, are optimistic that 2020 might be. Uh, uh, the date. Um, as far as land acquisition goes, 
Uh, we'll, we'll begin a pra an appraisal process at early next year, and once that's uh, completed, we can begin discussions with the landowners and follow the regulations required by the FAA for acquisition. Um, this next slide shows the airport uh, layout plan as it stands right now anyway. It may be tweaked a little bit, but those different colors uh, represent different landowners. Uh, so you'll see that there's nine different colors uh, and as I indicated earlier, uh, we've spoken directly with one-on-one -on -one conversations with seven of the nine. Um, and that those conversations have gone fairly well. So I think we've been able to address some concerns, answer some questions that those folks had, and they brought up uh, similarly to the pilots at the users meeting, they brought up some some uh, important issues that they had that we, is good, that's actually good to know as we plan ahead and plan for either easements in the area or uh, other types of, of issues, so. Um, <clears throat> With that, I would be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, you're going to put in an ILS system, is that right? You said a precision landing, that's ILS? Yes. Is that determined by the FAA, or is that something that you guys, I thought you had to have so many planes in there, or do you know? I think it's, a, it's going to be an FAA determination a requirement of that. So we, we will have the ILS. Yes. All right, yes. great. Jim, you explained the colors on the uh, actual airport footprint itself. Yep. But the other square sections with the diagonal lines in them? Yep. What are they? Good question. Uh, uh, for instance, if you look over to the left, uh, to the yellow property, and then there's yellow hash lines as well, the, that additional property is owned by that same landowner. Okay. So it shows, it shows not only the land that's directly impacted by the airport, but their surrounding uh, land too. So uh, for instance, there's a, if you look at the orange property, and it's got uh, two 40 acre pieces with a little triangle cut out of it, uh, more than likely we'll buy the little triangle as well, but to not leave that little piece there for the the landowner, but thank you. Yep. Any other questions for Jim? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to item C. Uh, this is a discussion and possible action on the city's support of the Blue Zones project. Uh, this item, at the request of City Council Member Van Zetten and Council Member Jimenez, is reserved for discussion and possible action relative to the City's current commitment to the Blue Zones project. After further review of the Blue Zones project pledge, there are three areas of scoring that the City must comply, a complete streets policy, tobacco policy, and the healthy eating and active living policy. In order for the City to comply with the pledge requirements, it must score at least one point in each category, totaling 13 points overall in the three categories. In the tobacco policy, a tobacco and smoking ban must be brought to include either multi-unit housing or a comprehensive smoke-free policy in all outdoor workplaces and public places. Under healthy eating and active living policy, there are many possible items that the city could choose uh, to limit choice, let's see, could choose to limit choices for its citizens so that we can nudge them into healthy behaviors such as uh, prohibiting establishment of fast food drive throughs or establishing a healthy food and beverage policy at city owned sporting event, youth sporting events, adopting building codes to require showers, changing facilities, and bike racks in municipal buildings, which are a few. Uh, these need to be voted into place as well as possible possible uh, action tax dollars as well as possible additional tax dollars that need to be invested to comply with policies. Further consideration and review of many pledge line items must be discussed before being able to move forward with the Blue Zones policy pledge. And so um, with that in mind, I guess I wasn't sure where you wanted to go with this, Jason, so I'll leave it yeah, to you. Well, I was trying to get this set up in a work session. Obviously, you didn't want it to go there, so I wanted to bring this back up. In order for us to even begin to get through this, we got to talk about the tobacco policy. You've got one or two choices to get through this, mm -hmm. and you've got to pick one of those two. You're either going to expand 
into multi-unit housing, which is telling people in the condos, condominiums, and properties that they own, they're not going to be able to smoke there. Or you've got to go the other route where we have a comprehensive smoke-free policy in all outdoor workplaces and public places. Once we figure that out, then you know we go on to the active living and healthy living policy, which we've got about 18 different things to choose from. And, and I went through this personally. I've got half of this list crossed off because it, it wasn't just as simple as sitting down and saying, which 18 are these going to do? Because there's some very broad terms in here. Um, if you look at number 17, for example, establish a healthy food and beverage policy at city-sponsored youth sporting events. Well, who do, who's going to determine what healthy food is? Uh, is that going to be left up to us? I mean, I work in the egg industry, so I get this all the time. I work with the USDA, FDA, and I can tell you every year a doctor comes out of Harvard with a new study that redefines what's healthy and what isn't healthy. Who are we going to leave that up to? So if you decided, okay, you don't, you don't want to go with that option, unhealthy is in several parts of this plan. So who's going to, who's going to determine that part of it? Is unhealthy that I have 16 ounces of pop? Is it 24? I mean, New York City tried to do this. Um, who are we going to leave that choice up to? And I guess the, the, the irritating fact to me is, you know, you take a guy at Cloud Valve that works, you know, 12 hour shift, he could be burning 4,000 calories. He goes out and he wants to have a pop and a hot dog at a game. You, we could, it's on here. We could say, guess what? You're not gonna have that hot dog and pop out there. Because somebody's gonna have to determine what's healthy and what isn't, and that's on that list. So just going, okay, we're gonna take this one, we're not gonna take that one, who decides that? And I'm, I'm just gonna say, it's probably not gonna be us. We'll probably pass that off to somebody else, and they'll go, eh, let's take this off the list. Let's take that off the list. But before this can even really go to committee, just look at the tobacco policy. Which one of those two are you going to do? <clears throat> and you know, I know that this is going to go to committee, but I think each one of us need to have input on this. Because it, you shouldn't be able just to hide behind the committee on this and say, oh, you know, I'm not going to pick this because the committee, you know, they recommended this. I would have gone a different way, but the committee recommended this. I think there's just too many issues in here that are so broad that you just say, I get where they're going, but from a government standpoint, you know, I, I'm all for, you know, go out, work out, live healthy, but we cannot be the enforcement arm. And, you know, especially when we're looking at tobacco policy, when you get into what are we really going to do? And that's what, I, that's what I'm trying to get into, is we got to talk about the details. You can't just blanket this thing. And I, I agree, there are several people up here, and we all know you're going to start diets and you're going to quit them. But we're not the people to say, hey, guess what, you can't commit. What about the people that signed up for Blue Zones? They don't get to quit now. They're, they're asking us to be the enforcement arm. I got, a, what, 1,000 people that signed up? Guess what? You're still in. You know, we're not letting you off the hook. How do they get out? Outside of all of that, if you just fact, just look at the tobacco policy, which one of those two are you going to go with? Because if you can't get through that, if, if the seven of us cannot get through this tobacco policy, there's no sense of even moving forward with this at all. You've got two choices there. I want to add something to... Um and we've talked before about the tobacco policy section here. I did a lot of research, and um, from what I gather right now, and there is more uh, information on each of these statements on this checklist. Um, one of the Blue Zone representatives sent me um, detailed information in regards to, uh, if you look on the tobacco section, item two there, um, detailed information for that one statement, what things we need to do. Right? So I looked into it. And I pulled out the Iowa Code Smoke Free Act. Item two, we meet item two with this right, right here, the Smoke Free Act. So we already got our right. three points. On top of that, um, on item one, there is, um, when it comes to multiple unit housing, I don't know if there's any multiple unit housing here in Oskaloosa that falls under the HUD. Uh, um, requirements, but HUD has, which I have in my hand right here from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, they have a, a requirement for any multi-unit um, housing units if 
that they have to have a smoking policy. HUD doesn't say the details of it. The unit has to, you know, say here's the policy uh, for that unit, for the, for the uh, multiple uh, housing unit. Then a little bit more research, I, looked, I found something in the state of Oregon, which was pretty interesting as far as in regards to item one, multiple unit housing. What they did there was um, the city basically just said there would be a requirement in the rental agreements. The city didn't specify the details of the not, you know, the uh, non-smoking. The owner of the rental unit had to have a smoking policy. How he did it, you know, it was up to them. But at least they, the city just said you need to have a smoking <coughs> policy and left it at that. And then they wrote one out. So I, I really think we should go to, to, to uh, I think we can cover, well, for sure, number two, but maybe a chance of even doing number one. But I think we need to get to uh, planning on this and look at other um, items here under the healthy eating and act, active living policy here. Those, how many items is there? 18. 18. Oh. But also I think Blue Zone should provide us these information sheets that cover each of these statements that there's a lot of information on here to help make you know our decision on what we're going to take what we're going to you know which ones we're going to look at joe where does it say in here that on number two a comprehensive smoke-free policy in all outdoor workplaces uh, here. now you can make me look for this thing there, and here it says enclosed yeah let's see it says public places and it also says are there. enclosed area. right all public places, I'm assuming, is sidewalks, streets? No, public places by the Smoke Free Act is like where people convene. Like, take the Emerson Park. And That's not enclosed. No. Um, you're talking about outdoor? It says outdoor. It says you said, outdoor, you said, right? You said, yeah. you said we already. Yeah, but I, I did mark that down in here to find what you're asking here. <coughs> I did go through this. This is yeah. there's like seven pages of this thing. And so we'd be talking like football stadiums. <coughs> you go to a it's, Hawkeye game, you can't smoke in that stadium. And that's right. the way it is um, in our stadium too. The pool there, Emerson Pool, you can't smoke in there. And, uh, the Emerson Park, the shelters, uh, you can't. You have a, a group of people there doing a cookout or whatever city activity, it doesn't matter. The group of people you cannot be smoking at. Same with the Lacey Stadium. Same too. with the Lacey Stadium. But, but, your signs but we're, not, we're not going to get there, but number two, by what you're saying. Because it says here, we can't even, you can't even go out and smoke on the golf course if you read this. But you can grill at a stadium, right? <coughs> you can't smoke, but you can run a, you, you can't smoke, but you can run a grill. It's just not going to be this easy. No, it's not. No, it isn't. It, no. It, and you're getting seven of us to agree <clears throat> on this point by point. I really think we all need to be down there. I, I, I mean, I know, Mr. Mayor, I know that we got a bunch on the plate. I really do. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be another one to put this on there. But, you know, you, you're talking about some very ambiguous terms. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of money on this. I mean, Codes to require showers and changing facilities and bike racks. Okay, yeah, we, we don't, that's just one of them, but there's so much in here to, to adopt policies. And that's what we're doing here. And we need to talk about specifically what those policies are and what we're getting into. Agreed. But I think what we have now, and, and Natalie, you might be able to offer some, some insights on this, is that <coughs> what, what Joe was given was definitions of what those statements mean. And so that has been the missing link. That, that, and that's why I want this thing to go to a committee instead of, instead of engaging the full council in, in hours of work sessions, is I want to get a, sub, you know, a subcommittee of our council together to actually go through and do the learning that's necessary in order to pick this thing up. That it's not as simple as just going down and looking at these statements, because they are broad. But there are definitions as to, you know, if, if you uh, went through confirmation in a Lutheran school, what does this mean is the thing that shows up right behind that little chunk of the Apostles' Creed that you're, you're trying to learn. It's the same thing with the Blue Zones. There is more meat to this. What we're seeing is the bare bones. And so for that perspective, that's why I want this thing to go into the planning committee. The, the conversations I've had have said that, yeah, all, it sounds like all the communities in Iowa can check the box. That num they're going to get number two. There's three points. You've nailed it. 
Joe, what he has mentioned about the state of Oregon, says, okay, so if we come out and say, oh, every landlord of a multi-unit housing has to have some sort of a statement that says whether you can or cannot smoke in his units, he owns the darn things, uh, that counts. So that might be five of the 13 points right there. But that's why I wanted to go to committee, is so that we don't get the whole council wrapped up in it. But I think the whole council absolutely needs to be wrapped up. Well, it'll get there. I mean, it'll I get there. But it shouldn't be filtered by somebody else. It shouldn't be, should be done out front, and you should be on the hook for supporting a policy that's going to regulate people. Exactly right. Yes. Yeah. And the way the committee system works is you have a subgroup of people who attack the problem. And it doesn't exclude anyone. So if the rest of the council wants to go to the committee meeting, they're welcome to do it. But the let the committee at least do its work before we bring the whole council in and have to go through this whole learning exercise. But if the, if the majority of council doesn't even support what's ha and that's kind of why I wanted to get here first, bring up the smoking policy, bring up some of this other stuff. If we're, saying, we're not going to spend money, I want to know what I, what I can take off the table before we even get there. What, what do you want to do? I mean, we've, we've had this up in like three meetings about, and say if the council doesn't support it. I mean, last week we clearly did support it. There's a majority that we didn't want to, we voted down not supporting it, so we said we did support it. I know it wasn't unanimous, well, we, but we, we had never we, we had we've never done this supported three or four times. This. What else are we doing tonight? We had never supported this back. We had said that we were going to continue to look at the application. And last, week, last, we last week, no. Last week, I just made the motion for the city to withdraw from blue zones completely. I never made a motion to support it or not support it. I'm not sure what you mean by that. I don't either. Yeah. Could you say that again? I never made a motion last week to support blue zones or not. To. I said, let's withdraw. As the city, let's withdraw. You guys never gave support to this. And going back, even to last meeting, everybody was talking about, hey, let's just keep looking at the application. Let's, let's get to this point. And we can go back through that again. But when you look through what was proposed at that meeting back on August back in October there. It so do you, do you want to do you want a motion on whether or not we as a council I, I support want, blue listen, zones? I, I've heard what I've heard here. Right. It, That's it why I'm asking like, what you want. You put it on the so agenda. So what, what you want to go with number two? Uh, well, I, I need to know what you want to go with. I wanted to go to the committee. I thought is what we were doing. But if you're saying it's because we haven't supported it, then let's take a vote on that. Yeah. Because you're right. If we haven't done that, if that, if that helps, if that, did you feel that's an important step to go to committee? No, I felt what an important step was is getting through the tobacco policy at this point. Well, I think what you're trying to get to is, is gov should government say that we own the air outside? And we don't. I mean, really, in a simple, simple term, that's it. We don't. I, we do not own the air outside. And we can't regulate that. How could we possibly regulate that? If you're not going to get past number two, and there's a majority of people here that says, you know what, new information has come to light. I can't get past one or two of this tobacco policy. As far as, far as what our commitment is to this pledge, we're not going to be able to get through it. I just thought I heard that we can get to number two. Uh, no, we can't. No. No, you can't. Um, I didn't, Natalie, you're I with the Blue had... Zones. Could you take the microphone, please? So I did speak with the state team and we have already achieved those points um, with the policy that's already put in place for the Smoke Free Act. So you've already achieved that. You've already achieved three points for that. So So we've got that covered. Right, correct. Okay. Thank you. That's not an answer to your question though, is it? I I mean I know where we stand on it, so um, can I make one statement? I don't, I don't know where you stand now with, with your research on well, it. Well, that was my concern. It was uh, the tobacco section. And then uh, before I received this other information from Blue Zone, in regards to item two, I did a lot of investigation prior to that. And uh, when I looked up the Iowa, what's it called? Sorry. Smoke Free Act, sorry. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, item two sounds like it falls right into the And she says the, uh, it does. Right. Okay. You she were going to say something else, Natalie. Well, I have two, two comments. Um, my first comment is I live in the rural community. So the city council, um, this process is new for me. I'm learning um, the dynamics of how this works. And so I did a little research as well. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but one thing I researched was like, what's the objective of city council? And so what I found in my research, it's to set the vision for our city. 
And when we look at the statistics for Oskaloosa and our youth, um, we look at what employers are saying about the cost and rise of health care. I, I, it would be great if we could get to the point of um, looking at the benefits of this and seeing if they outweigh the negatives. And I feel as if, um, you know, I've uh, definitely made myself available to have conversations with everyone um, on the council as well as the mayor and uh, city manager uh, to answer any questions you might have. I do have detailed descriptions with uh, research backing why these options are important uh, for us as individuals, for our children, for future um, taxpayers. And um, I certainly would love to provide that to you as well. Um, I would be happy to meet with you, uh, Mr. Van Denton, if you would uh, like to do coffee or I could answer some questions. I could bring somebody from the state team. We, um, we want to make sure that this is something you want to do, but you need to give us an opportunity um, to answer your questions. And it was my understanding that we would do that through a uh, planning committee. And um, the second statement, excuse me, I just want to make is um, we've already logged 200 hours of individuals volunteering for Blue Zones Project. I really think that that demonstrates uh, the need and the want for this in our community. Um, and I, I just, um, I really beg you to just give us an opportunity. We, we have an exciting team and Mahaska Health Partnership has already footed the cost of housing us and seeing the value in this. We're just asking you um, for your time and allowing us to explain what this could do for our community. Thank you. Thanks, let me ask yeah. you. Let me ask you a question while you're up there. Mm -hmm. On a national level, forget the city of Oscars. On a national level, what's the blue blue zone doing for a nation? For example, food stamps. There's 47 million recipients out there that gets food stamps. Are we telling them now that they can no longer get pop, candy, cookies, with their food stamps? No. Why? Wouldn't that be a good place to start? Possibly. I, a thought. Right, and that is a thought, and I, um, you know, I don't have the ability to make that decision. I can voice uh, my opinions, you know, as a citizen to our government, but I see a value in in raising well-being, and so that's why I took an opportunity to leave a job that I had that was sustainable and um, venture into a position where I saw that we could make value and impact in our community. And so I'm choosing to make a difference in, in the community uh, where I live and work in. And um, that may be all I can do as a citizen right now to improve the well-being, but at least I'm doing something. I, I realize that, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I have nothing against the, the blue zone and the concept of it. I'm just saying, are we starting in the right places? Maybe we should start at the national level and start working down. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We make a policy on food stamps, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll rule it out of order today. All right, yeah. let me know. Uh, are we asking for the? I, I don't know, Joe. Where, just uh, where do you stand with the smoking thing right now? Uh, right okay. now, um, from when I the information I got in regards to item two, um, I'm all right with it. Okay. Was that housing? I have no motion at this time. Was that housing thing? Was that federal housing only, or was that? No, no. The on the house number one there. That's two. He's yeah. Two. Item one, where it talks about the multiple unit housing. Oh, the smoking uh, issue. Yeah. Um, I was looking into that, and I saw something from HUD. If there is any multiple. And that's why I said that was HUD. That was HUD, and then the state of Oregon, and this was not in regards to HUD. This is private owned. Mm -hmm. I uh, have one for my rental. Rental window. place, mm -hmm. right? That the city, I don't think it was the city, what do you call, uh, housing development of that city, I forgot what they call their, their office. But anyways, saying it was that to have the owners in their rental agreement to uh, have some sort of smoking policy. So the city was demanding of, of the rental property owner that they made a policy just to have a policy. The city demanded that of those people. Is that what um, you said? It says it must disclose a disclosure of a smoking policy for the premises of which the dwelling is located. That's all it says. So it could, the policy could be say, could say, yep, you know, smoke if you want, pets if yeah. you want. The city didn't dictate 
in other words, to the housing unit. Well, here's where the smoking areas are and all that stuff. They left that up to the, the uh, unit. Whether the, you did or did not. Pardon? Whether you did or did not. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Again, I was just preliminary. I didn't really look in depth on it, but I just couldn't put good information here. And I, I heard you say, blue zone people say you called the state, and we already are in compliance for two, right? My concern is I don't want to come across as, okay, you will do this from the city. Exactly. That's my main concern. If we start going down that road, then we're going to have probably different conversations there. But with that said, don't we do that all the time? Well, yeah. It's in the interest yeah. of our city. Yeah. We do it all, every, yeah. almost every meeting. We say right. you're not going to park I remember here. Someone or you're said, not going to do this. No, oh but that's I remember, what we do. That's like someone said to me about the, this item one on the tobacco. They said, well, some places tell you can't have door, uh, yeah. pets. pets. As yeah, that's the owner telling you that. It's not the city telling you that. Mm -hmm. So that was just small don't talk. We say things like you can't let your pet run free. Right. So, I mean, well, that's the business we're in, know. setting policy. We either believe this is good or we don't. And right. I really want to thank Dr. Whitus for coming in tonight. I mean, if, if what she said to us doesn't get us behind this 100%, we got to be smart about it. Well, we're well, we're also sending personal. the wrong message about what we want the city to be in the future. And not only what she said, if we just, we're all about business and bringing in business. We already have three full-time salaries funded by this. When a business looks at coming to Oskaloosa, we can point to this and say some of the things that we're doing and make us look more attractive. For our residents that are already here, she gave all kinds of reasons why we should do this. We already have a thousand people that are excited about this and wanting to do it. I would hate to think that we are going to come back and say philosophically we cannot support this. Um, I, I just really urge all of you to get behind this. I think it's an excellent Excellent idea. I, I talked to several people who signed up for Blue Zones, and not one of them saw this policy. Not one of them said, they go, they want you to do what? They go, what if I decide to quit? I'm not letting you, you're asking your city not to let you off the hook. So, you know, in my industry, there's consumer protection programs that make sure that you don't sell a product that you don't tell the details on. And so that's, you know, when they started seeing this, all of a sudden I said, listen, fine for me and it's fine for businesses to make their decisions but it's not fine for us as government to tell you what to do maybe we should just call for another vote before I, there's no motion on the table well no motion. does anybody want to make that motion well i think i'm one of the pers persons on the small client planning group and i'm more than happy to spend the time to work through this and do the research and bring it back to council or no. anyone on the council that wants to come i think you're on it too joe i'm planning yeah. Yeah, we need to go to the planning. Okay. I would caution other council members showing up to that committee meeting. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's not. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Three people are going to decide for twelve. Yeah, we we There's notice those, those meetings though, right? But what's that? Yeah, I've tried to do meetings. that, and he always kicks me out. So yes, I, he won't let you do it. Okay. Yes, we notice those meetings. We ask that the, the subcommittee try to become the experts on the topic that's being discussed, so that they can then relay. Uh, their perspectives on the subject matter to the rest of the council who oftentimes don't have the time or the desire to put their own additional research or, or uh, effort into it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do your own research and, and meet on your own and do that other due diligence. We actually encourage that. But this was just supposed to be a process that would ease you and your workload based on the other meetings. We've got oh work God. sessions scheduled. Every, for every meeting. Uh, we could certainly meet every Monday of the month. I don't think most of you want to do that based on previous feedback. So the, the subcommittee's not making decisions. They can't. They're not, a, they're not a quorum. So the idea is that you have some debate, maybe you polish the debate up in a not so public setting on camera, and we come out looking good on something, and if we disagree, we disagree, but we do that in a professional way. Again, this is about our image. And so what happens in here, how we treat other people, that reflects on this community, reflects on us as an organization, me as staff. And honestly, it, it just, we really need to think about that, especially as we're trying to figure out what the brand of the community is. 
There's absolutely no reason we shouldn't be able to talk about this in public. You're the bosses. It, it just I mean, takes four no people to make that happen. There is no reason people shouldn't know what's happening. And that's mm -hmm. all we're doing here. But that's the point, is the, the council's going to come together again once the committee has met, and you're going to have the opportunity to have a full discussion and debate. But I think the idea is that, again, you're going to have three people who have hashed out a lot of that, that topic or that subject matter mm -hmm. in a setting that is probably a little more conducive to it. I'm as right, I'm so right, I don't even have a left hand. And I, <laughs> and, I am so conservative, it makes most people sick. But on this case, and, and I know where Tom, Gemini's, we've talked a lot, and, and Tom protects a lot of that stuff, and, and, and I'm, I'm usually on Tom's side. <coughs> but when Dr. Ann says that it's the first generation, and we all know this, this is in the news all the time, the first generation that's not going to live longer in the United States of America, and most of it's from obesity, you know, I think we got, we, we got to try to do a part. And I've said every time we've had these meetings, and I'll, sit, I'll help the subcommittee, whatever, I'm not voting for something that costs the taxpayer money, and I'm not going to vote for somebody that tells somebody what they got to do. But I think you can work around this. Now, Jason feels concerned that that'll backfire on us, and he could be right. But I can see I'm the odd one. The smoking, that's a no-brainer to me. The complete streets, I had to research that because I didn't know what complete streets were. Well, as it turns out, it's Double. those funny-looking curbs we all got at the intersections that 15 years ago when we did streetscape, nobody knew, why did they have all that there? Well, that's a complete street, the way I, as I research it. They have rules like that. You don't have to do it. It even says the streets look different in a rural and an urban area. So, you know, I just, I can come up with 16 or 17 points here. I think the committee will find the same and, and not step on anybody's toes. But that's just mine. I'm not seeing any particular motions, so any other comments, or we'll move on. So it's just going to committee. But it is going, it's going to committee. To committee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Item D. Consider an ordinance amending the city code of the city of Oskaloosa by deleting current code chapter 10.78, inserting in lieu thereof a corrected section to comport with the state statutes. This is the first reading. Uh, chapter 10.78 of the Oskaloosa Municipal Code addresses the use of ATVs and snowmobiles. The ordinance in its current form is based upon Iowa Code Chapter 321I, uh, all-terrain vehicles, but does not perfectly comport therewith. The proposed ordinance amending Chapter 10.78 deletes current city code Chapter 10.78 and inserts in lieu thereof a corrected section to comport with state statutes. Um, do we have a motion? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'm all for it, but it looks like another one of these ones that we're going to, we're, we're tweaking it and it, and it needs tweaked, obviously. But then if we're going to go out and start enforcing it, because we, we don't really enforce it now, there's four wheelers driving down the streets like we've talked about. So it's going to come out that we created a new, <laughs> new problem, but it That's looks to me like we're just enforcing what we have. Are we banning the ATVs and the four-wheelers off the streets? What's the code say? They were always supposed to be. They, are, they never have been. Never ever. But it's okay for golf carts to be on the streets. <clears throat> yep. I think that was a separate rule. And that makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> if I can ride my golf cart up here, why can't I ride my ATV up here? You might want to put it on the agenda for the next week. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Roll call, please. First day? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Caligari? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Benzet? No. Okay. <laughs> that passes. Moving on to item E. Uh, consider an ordinance amending driveway culvert <coughs> regulations in Oskaloosa. Second reading, uh, the staff was requested to conduct research, provide recommendations on driveway culvert requirement updates to the city code. Currently, the Oskaloosa Municipal Code states that driveway culverts must be either corrugated metal pipe, uh, acronym of CMP, or reinforced concrete pipe, which is RCP, with a minimum diameter of 12 inches. 
thermoplastic pipes such as high density polyethylene, which is HDPE, and polyvinyl chloride, which is PVC, are not listed as allowable materials for driveway culverts. Staff research indicates that many cities only permit the RCP or CMP for the driveway culverts. However, there are cities that have adopted plastic pipes for driveway culverts. Some are enforced with department guidelines and some with code updates that provide specifications. And the major revisions recommended by staff uh, based research are as follows. Uh, first, create uh, specifications to meet the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and American Society for Testing and Materials Standards. Second, create specifications for the types of pipe based on the amount of cover. And third, allow HDPE and PVC for driveway culverts if they meet the AASHTO and ASTM standards. Y'all keeping up with this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At their meeting on April 14, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended by a vote of 5-0 to approve the code changes with the stipulation that these regulations be stated to comply or stated to apply to the residential driveways. And so then we've got the various adjustments to code uh, listed. Do we have a motion approving this? Second. Okay. <clears throat> Any discussion? Roll call, please. Warren? Yes. Yates? Yes. Calgary? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Benzetton? Yes. Stay? Yes. Okay, that passes. Item F. Let's consider an ordinance to establish the no parking zone along both sides of South 4th Street between 13th Avenue East and 15th Avenue East. This is the second reading. The Public Works Department received a resident request to restrict parking along South 4th Street from 13th Avenue East to 15th Avenue East. Mm -hmm. Currently, there are no parking restrictions on either side of the section of South 4th Street. The street pavement is chip seal with the width of the street varying from 22 to 26 feet. The section of street does uh, this section of street does experience a higher than normal level of bus and tru truck traffic due to the presence of Oskaloosa School Bus Garage and other businesses that are along 13th Avenue East. Planning and zoning at their meeting on March 10th of 2014 considered the resident request to restrict parking along South 4th Street from 13th Avenue East to 15th Avenue East. At this meeting, they asked staff to research the possibility of converting this section of street to a one-way southbound traffic only. Survey was then conducted with the one-way street option listed along with the parking restriction options. Of the respondents, two, namely 20%, wanted to leave the on-street parking as is. Seven, 70%, wanted to prohibit parking on both sides at all times. And one of them, 10%, wanted to prohibit parking on the west side at all times. None of the respondents opted to convert the street to a one-way street. At their meeting on April 14, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended by a vote of three to two to approve southbound one-way traffic along South 4th Street from 13th Avenue East to 15th Avenue East, along with a parking restriction along the east side of said section of South 4th Street. The City Council, at our meeting on April 21st, approved the first reading of the ordinance to restrict parking along both sides of South 4th Street between 13th Avenue East and 15th Avenue East. And so there's a note in here, if parking is restricted along both sides of South 4th Street between 13th and 15th Avenue East, then there's an ordinance amendment that's indicated that has to be put into code and uh, there's various alternative actions that are suggested as well. Uh, so do we have a motion? I'll leave it at that. Uh, you know, the, the title is to consider an ordinance uh, for no parking along both sides of 4th Street between 13th Avenue East and 15th Avenue East. Do we have a motion to support that? I'll make a motion to deny it. Okay. Second. I'm second from Tom. Discussion. It sounds like, I don't really get the whole issue, but it sounded like to me there was some real headway made here at the end that there might be another possibility on the solution. Is that right? It's, it sounds like there could be. So, yeah. so if we could, you know, do you know, the length of a semi or whatever, I don't know what the exact amount is, no parking from 15th North on both sides to allow the buses and the semis to get turned. It would still allow parking then to the north for the two properties in, in question, from what I heard. It seems like we win. It sounds like a win-win yeah. -win to me. You so whether we can amend head, this motion. I mean, I'm one of the property owners. I can't speak for all of them, but having 
go in there almost every day for different reasons. You said it would take care of the issue that I've seen, but now I don't. Rick, what do you, what do you think? Is it bus traffic that's causing it? What's going on? What, what's the problem there? Yeah, would you come up to the microphone, please? And in your name, please. And uh, I, I think it's just the uh, semi traffic, basically. Like maybe Midland Metals. Uh, and they like to go that way so they could back in from their left. So the truck driver can back in from their left, I think, is what the issue is. Yeah, there's a couple of trucking things, Beanster Trucking's up there, and the way they back in. And, uh, yeah, Beanster would. He would come in from that way. Because uh, in the past, I had to put a post up in the, in the yard to keep the trucks out of my yard because they turn the corner and have to go up in the in the yard to make the corner. So what would it be possible to amend this? That's what I was wondering. As Doug is saying and then go ahead and vote and get it off so we don't have to talk about it next week. Does or, his solution seem to be something that you think uh, the here to corner away? I think we'll probably solve a lot of that. I don't think you can just amend this. I yeah, we may have to go back to the property owners if we're going to do something different for Keelish. Do we have to resurvey? Do we have to? You don't have to. It's just something that we, we try to do to reach out to the residents in the area or the affected property owners. Um, I, I guess what I would do is if you're going to change it again completely, I would reset it as a, as a first reading next time. Okay. okay. And vote it down this time and then... Bring it back. Sure, if that's if that's the direction you'd like to go, okay. and then we could work up something that would be I don't know how many feet, 60 feet or 30 feet or whatever it is. Do you have something you want to say? I just do have one observation. Um, uh, microphone, please. Okay. Sir. Um, because the traffic in this area affects. Um, not only the businesses on 13th, but the residents on 15th. And that is zoned residential. The street between our residences is also zoned residential. I think the zoning um, that the city is committed to um, should have carry some weight there, that it isn't simply a vote of one street or another. If you're going to bring this down to a vote of commercial interests on 13th, as opposed to residential interests on 15th, then let's expand it to the residential area on 15th. Obviously, if you uh, are going to only survey 13th Street, um, then obviously the vote is going to be lopsided. But I might make the point that the folks back on 13th don't live in that area. They, they do do business there. We do understand the need for uh, commercial interest there. But residents also have certain needs for safety, and um, certainly an increase in traffic there at that corner not only affects our properties, but our nearby neighbors also uh, are affected residentially wise. Judy, who lives across the street, her driveway is right smack at that intersection on the other side of the street. So there are more residences that are, will be affected uh, by what happens on that corner. So. It's just an observation as far as I'm concerned. If we are going to go back and ask everybody in the neighborhood, then perhaps we can ask the residents as well. I don't think that you will find that the vote will be quite so lopsided. Thank you. Is there a way to solve this without the city? Have you made a comment? No. That I 
the city is doing it. There seems to be a misconception that we're in here making no parking all over the city. We don't want to do that. We're just, all you know, we're doing is we're taking requests and we're, I'm sitting here going, you made a great point. I'm like, can here, you get here, us out of this? Here, yes, here, here is my observation. Oskaloosa in general is undergoing growing pains. Our neighborhood in particular is undergoing growing pains. As my neighbor pointed out, had we been apprised initially of what the complaint was, we could have probably worked it out voluntarily. As a matter of fact, without even knowing what the complaint was, we attempted to do that. We don't want to see it here. We think that all over the city, people like us and in neighborhoods like ours, we make allowances, we suffer some inconvenience, we do occasionally have to drive around, park cars, and if you um, look at Sheriff Avenue and Market, there's congestion. If you look at K Avenue and Market, look at the parking at the apartments on K Avenue. Everybody shares the street, and we certainly would love to do that. We don't want to be restricted from using the street. We want to share the street. That's my point. Fair. There's a couple and things. we're willing to do so. Sorry. Thank you. Jake may be able to help us, but I think it's illegal to park on the parking, isn't it, in Oskaloosa? I've been ticketed for it. You, can, you can't park your car in the parking. The right of way? In the right of way? Yes. The right yeah. of way. Yeah, I mean, that car in the white picture, that car is illegally parked, I think. He's in the right of way. He's in, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's got to be parked in the street. If it's street legal parking, he's got to be in the street. He can't be in the park. Is that right, Jake? That's right. Yeah. May I make one observation about that? Well, I'm, let me finish. Because okay. so where, where I'm headed with this is if you're, if you're both going to park, you're never going to get parking on both sides of that street. You might get back to just one because if they park illegally, the street's not wide enough. And my other confusion is this. In October is when I first heard of this because I had two bus drivers bring it to my attention. And at that time, I said, you guys need to take it back to, to, to the school system and bring it forward if it's, a, if it's a dangerous situation. Now, what I'm understanding here, uh, the school board looks like, or the school was asked, but I, don't, I guess they didn't bring this forward. So that's my information. <laughs> Charlie? What do you think, Charlie? <laughs> I just wanted to um, address the width of the street. The curb opening uh, for fourth is 28 feet, same as second, same as seventh. The, it's a, it does not have curves. But the narrowest part of the street, and I had my tape measure out there, is 26 feet. It's not 22 feet. And um, it, uh, I would think that if it's supposed to be a 28 foot street defined by that curb, the car should, we should have 28 feet of width to park. Makes it exactly the same as 2nd Avenue where there's a whole lot more truck traffic going to Cloud than there is going into that street. Well, they aren't supposed to be, but we don't enforce that either. If you notice the signs are posted, they are not supposed to be on the oh. south half of South Second. They're supposed to be going north, yes. but that's another story. Well. Yeah. They're there. Well, and I might address the parking on the right of way up on K Avenue, right at the corner there by Market Street. The parking is on the right of way. Those vehicles uh, uh, are not even not even angle parking in. They are backed in. Their back ends or front ends hang over the sidewalk, and the other extremity of their vehicle is in the street. So while the city may look <laughs> at certain situations differently when it comes down to, uh, as you make the point, uh, is it legal or not legal to park on the right of way? I think that there is a leeway to 
obviously we do that up on K uh, to alleviate certain problems. So um, we don't, I don't want to come across as saying um, we are unwilling to work with the folks back on 13th. We certainly have been trying to do that. Uh, and we are hoping that what we have already voluntarily done alleviates the problems. Uh, and um, Doug, as you said, there may be some issues there. If there's other issues that, that we don't know about, you know, we'd, we would certainly. But one thing I do know about the bus bar, and as I brought up at planning and zoning, sometimes it's just a matter of being a good neighbor. If you are in, if you are driving a school bus or driving a truck, you know that at certain times in the city there are areas that you avoid, just because of the constriction and the traffic. You know getting out of McDonald's at a certain time of the day is bad. You know on Friday and Saturday night trying to get from Penny's to, to across there, that also is bad. You avoid those areas. Why? Because we just know better. And we think that the folks back on 13th and also, us as residents now understand the complexity of the issue. We try to avoid problems if we can and be good neighbors. We think that it would be helpful if the community school district would also understand that there are other um, inconveniences that everyone suffers in that area, not just commercial interests, not just residential area, uh, things, but many other things that people who live there do put up with in order to accommodate commercial traffic. We simply would like some consideration in return. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to deny. Any other comments? Roll call. Gates. What am I voting for? This is two. So I'm not voting for the motion we have. You're, the, oh. we're just not turning denied. down the second reading. We're, right. We're turning down the second reading. Yeah. Oh. You could all. I mean, it, let me let me muddy the water. You could motion to deny and then direct staff to come back with another item in the future, which would. I do what? To to that's what we were. That's what we would look for. Okay. That helps us. Okay, and I think Doug. Made us, I came up with somewhat of a solution, and that would be what we would deny this and ask the sit you to bring back on the agenda this new idea. Yeah, I, I don't has. know the exact distance, but I'd certainly like to accommodate the residents and, and make that turn a little better for the trucks and the buses. And if there's a way that we can do that and all win, um, that's what I'd like for staff to evaluate. I don't know whether it would be a two. I don't know whether it's I'm, 60 foot or, so I don't want to put a yeah, number on it. I would just specific, like yeah. for you guys to evaluate if there's a good way to, to do that. Sure. Is that okay with you, Jason? Yes. Well, why, do, why do we have to do that? Why don't we let them evaluate it? Maybe they can solve it on their own and we're out of it. I, I mean, if you feel like we need to be involved, you know, we're here. But I kind of see, and everybody's like, oh. Uh, you know, here's the way that I feel about it. Oh. If you guys can solve, uh, hold on. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just hold on. I got it. If if we can get away and you guys can handle it, great. If we need to come back and do it, then, then we should do it. But right now, no. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm on no on both sides of this. Okay. So the, the motion is just to pull the plug on the, the no parking on both sides of South 4th Street. So back to the roll call. But then that doesn't allow us a way to look at other options? At this point, no. But you could, I assume. So how do we would get be that? Able... You come back with a motion after this one. Yeah. If you want to oh, put that okay. on the table, make a motion. I got a motion after that. Okay. <laughs> All right, then I guess I'm voting yes. <laughs> Well, well. Yes, to pull the plug. I'll need two hours of consultation yeah. in the morning. Wait, the motion the was attorney to, to know deny. What I voted for, but. Yeah, motion to deny, and so a yes would be in agreement with your motion. All right. Okay. Okay. I think I voted. Yeah, negative motions Holy are cow. no fun whatsoever. Calajari? Uh, yes. 
Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Benjamin? Yes. Day? Yes. Rawling? Yes. Okay, that right. passes. That failed. Yeah, so we pulled the plug on, <laughs> so that there's on no parking on both sides. Anything else? Directing right, staff. Joe. Well, I, yeah, now I can make a motion. Yeah, Joe, this, right? go for it. All right. I've been out to that area. I'm not as well, I don't live out there, but I've been out there. Uh, what I, let me get to my map here. Anyways, what I would make a recommendations, before I do that, isn't there a fire hydrant on that corner? No. There is, yes. There is. Right. I'll make a, uh, a motion to just do a no parking from the curb back 25, 25 feet on either side. And the reason I say that, uh, the morning I went out there, I did meet up with a school bus coming down, and there was a green Jeep park uh, across the street. And he was up, up, he was up the road a little bit, maybe a little bit more than 25 feet. Well, you know, it's a small street. People got to take their time, bus coming. I pulled behind the Jeep, waited till the bus went by and drove around. And the reason for the 25 feet that way, anybody turning into the road, there's no car parked right there, it might cause an accident. And plus, on this other side, there's a fire hydrant. And you don't want to be parked there blocking the fire hydrant. That's my recommendation, doing a no parking from 25 feet. On or both sides staff look on both sides. Just look, why don't you just make a motion and staff looked at it. I'm sorry. Get a measurement. I went on rambling. I oh, yeah. Motion Make them, for uh, staff? For both sides. For to staff, staff to, to look at. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do we have a second for staff to look at it? Second. Okay. Is that what your motion was, staff to look at it? Yep. After I talked him into it, yeah. Okay. We, we've talked about this long enough. Okay. Good enough. Anybody else want to comment? Wait, cool. Roll call, please. Pellagiri? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Benzetton? Yes. Verstey? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Okay, that passes. I'm taking us to item number G. Uh, consider an ordinance amending the Oskaloosa Municipal Code, reflecting parking restriction along both sides of North 11th Street from C Avenue East to J Avenue East. This is the second reading. Uh, when reviewing proposed parking changes along E Avenue East, city staff became aware that a parking restriction along the west side of North 11th Street was not listed in the Municipal Code. Currently, signs indicating a parking restriction are in place along both sides of North 11th Street from C Avenue East to J Avenue East. The city code states that parking is restricted along the east side only. This section of North 11th Street is 26 feet wide from back of curb to back of curb, which is too narrow to allow both two-way traffic and on-street parking. So therefore, staff is recommending council approve the ordinance to make a change to the Oskaloosa Municipal Code reflecting the existing parking restriction along both sides of North 11th Street from C Avenue East to J Avenue East. Do we have a motion? So move. move. Third Any discussion? Tonight. Third time we did that tonight. Roll call. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Benzetton? Yes. Griste? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Calajuri? Yes. Okay, that passes. Item H, consider approval of a pay request number six to DeLong Construction. $23,319.85 for work completed on the West Area Sanitary Sewer Improvements Project. Um, City of Oscars has received the pay request from DeLong Construction uh, for work completed through April 28th of 2014 on the West Area Sanitary Sewer Improvements Project. Staff reviewed the pay request, found it to be satisfactory for work completed on the project, and pay request six reflects work completed on the pump station, the backfill, grading, and seating. Uh, progress payments for the contract and Iowa Code Chapter 573 need to be made for labor and materials incorporated into the work. The progress payment or retainage percentage will not relieve the contractor of any obligation to repair any defective work or materials. Staff is recommending approval that the council approve pay request six in the amount of $23,319.85 to DeLong Construction Incorporated. Do you have a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Any comments? Roll call, please. Moore? Yes. Benzetton? Yes. Verste? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Calgary? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Okay, item I. Oh, that passes. <coughs> item I. Uh, consider approval of the request from the Cellar Peanut Pub at 206 Rock Island Avenue for outdoor entertainment, extend outdoor service area, alcohol consumption outside building premises, and a temporary variance from the noise ordinance. Mr. Marty Duffy, the owner of the Cellar Peanut Pub at 206 Rock Island Avenue, has submitted a request to have outdoor entertainment. 
extend outdoor service area, alcohol, con alcohol consumption outside the building premises, and temporary variance from the noise ordinance on Saturday, May 17th from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. The subject property is currently zoned as Urban Corridor District, which does not permit outdoor entertainment. The current land use is as a cocktail lounge where alcohol cannot be consumed outside the building <coughs> premises. Alcohol consumption outside the building premises on the parking lot area violates open container law. The Oskaloosa Municipal Code does not allow for land uses similar to a beer garden where alcohol consumption is permitted outside of the building premises. And Mr. Duffy is also requesting a variance from Oskaloosa Municipal Code section 9.12.040 for the noise standards outlined in the ordinances. The fencing and existing the fencing and exiting provisions will need to be inspected for the safety of the occupants and any structures associated with the entertainment will also require permits and inspections to assure safety. In addition, vehicular parking will also need to be arranged for those attending since the present parking lot will be used for commercial recreation. If Cloud Valve Company parking lot is used for this event, then Mr. Duffy needs the approval from Cloud Valve Company. The above request for outdoor commercial recreation, extension of outdoor service area, alcohol consumption in the parking lot area, and a noise ordinance on variance on the commercial property will need council approval. Do we have a motion to that effect? Second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call, please. Ben Zetton? Yes. River State? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Calajari? Yes. Jimenez? Yes. Moore? Yes. Okay, that passes. <clears throat> Item J is to consider a motion directing the city manager to execute the necessary documents for acquisition and demolition of 517 B Avenue West. Uh, the property located at 517 B Avenue West was recently condemned by the city due to unsafe living conditions. All residents have been ordered out of the property and the building secured until required improvements can be corrected. Since that time, the property owner, Mr. Kelly Blunt, has approached the city and offered to deed the property over to the city free and clear of any liens. Staff is seeking the council's input on acquiring the property at no cost from Mr. Blunt with the intent of pursuing demolition of the building as soon as practical. The city would be responsible for the demolition cost as well as any property maintenance that would need to occur thereafter. Staff is recommending the building at 517 B Avenue West be demolished regardless of ownership. Funding for this demolition could come from the funds set aside for the A Avenue and Market Street Corridor Improvement Program. Do we have a motion uh, supporting this? So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Do we have any estimate on what the demolition cost will be? None. And, and that's, I guess I would say, in addition to seeking direction to, to potentially demolish it, if we could sell it or if there is a way of refurbishing it, yes, we'd like to explore that or moving it off site or something. Uh, but no, we do not know the cost of, of removal at this point in time. Um, we just got this, what, Thursday, I think it was? Yes. Um, so I've heard a number of 30,000, but I don't know if that's accurate. That didn't come from us. What do we think? That, according to the appraiser, the land value is dollars $17,000? Yes, sir. And the building at 55 for a total 71.6. I think that's generous. But we're saying the building needs so. to be demolished. So when we demolish it, we'll spend thirty thousand dollars to demolish it to end up with a sixteen thousand dollar piece of property. Potentially. Quite frankly, the lot's probably worth more empty. But well, there's there's no doubt in my mind about that, especially in that location. So we condemned it. <coughs> he doesn't want to tear it down. He gives it to the city, and it turns into our problem. Well, that, that's kind of the, the, the dilemma with this item is, yeah, if we start putting pressure on people and they don't want to do anything with it, what happens? Well, yeah, they always come to us. They don't always. They, they can come to us and say they want to walk away. And, and that so, turned around pretty quick, too, didn't it, really, from what he was going on about earlier, not having so much in it. The, yeah, the alternative is uh, we can proceed with... Uh, the order to condemn the property and uh, quite frankly we can pursue jail time for the owner if he doesn't comply with rehab or demolition. So those are the options. If we say no, then then that's probably the route we would that is the route we would proceed with because that's already in motion. Which if I can add to that too, number one obviously well, that's correct. At the same time the city has previously paid money 
to buy some properties to go ahead and demolish the place too, and this is one we would be getting right. having given to us for nothing. But it's really not on the A Avenue corridor. It's just well, it is not, obviously. It's it's visible, of course. It's a visible. highly visible location. Yeah, very visible. Oh, yeah, it's not. visible. I'm okay with this one because of the location and where it's at. What I'm not what I would like to know is the demolition costs and what if we find a gas well or something underneath there? Is he going to be on the hook for some of this? Uh, that's that's where I get. Yeah. It's, once it's ours, it's going to be ours. Once it's ours, right? it's ours. I, yeah. Yeah, obviously, we can we can delay the the action on this, I suppose, and and try to get bids on demolition if you want to. If you'd rather know that before we go in uh, to an agreement. Which I don't have a problem with. It was just we were trying to get this in front of you as soon as we could. Mm -hmm. And I, I like Jason. I, I'm, I'm in favor of it. It's not in the quarter, but it is in a location that I certainly support it. I'm probably not as concerned about the unknowns as maybe I should be. I just like to know the cost. I mean, if it's if it's a reasonable, reasonable cost to tear it down, it seems like it's worth it. Uh, I just don't have an idea of what that would be. You know, I'd like to have that, but okay, you come back next week. Sixty thousand dollars. You gonna put the guy? You gonna put him in jail? I mean, ultimately, yeah. you're, you're just. He's either you're either gonna put him in jail or you're gonna take the you're gonna take it. And you know, you know the location where it's at. I think it's good for us. I think this time it's probably a good deal to go with it. Yeah. What's the take zoning there? Is that commercial zone or residential? residential. Three? But it could be changed pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say that. Um, wow. You could always uh, they could apply for a rezone. Um, we'd have to look at everything else around it, mm -hmm. yeah, but it could be amended. All right. Yeah. It's looking at the the picture up there, or that that we have displayed. So uh, I'm trying to remember what that building is immediately to the east. That's a uh, apartment. That's the. Uh, so that's our more apartment. Yeah. Okay. And then to the east or west is a little house. One little house, sir, yeah. And then the rest of it, what, sheds and garages. So there's one more house between there and the track. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so R3 makes a lot of sense. To, yeah, right there. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's see, where are we? where you found the old pictures, because that building hasn't looked like that for a long time. Uh -uh. <laughs> it's all online. Huh? All online. Yeah, but... That's one. Okay, so we have a, we have a motion and second for uh, executing necessary documents for acquisition and demolition. Any further comments? Without any concern with cost. With, without any concerns at this point. Well, I'm assuming they're going to get three or four bids, you know, or one. Mm -hmm. We get multiple quotes on it. Okay. Roll call, please. First day. Yes. Walling. No. Yates. No. Caligari. No. Jimenez. Yes. Moore. Yes. Benzetten. Yes. And it passes four three. Okay, moving on. Item eight. Ah. Any other items from city staff? Starting with city manager. I'll hand this out and we can talk about it later. How about that? <laughs> Please. That's the route I'm going with tonight. <laughs> More to come. That's all I have there. Okay. A city clerk, anything? No, sir. The city attorney, anything? Oh, nothing. I'm sorry. I was nope. reading over Jason's shoulder. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> the intriguing documentation. <laughs> yes. Just so everybody knows, what this is an update yeah. to the, the uh, project list and the goal sheet that we typically review uh, in June. Yeah. And again, right before my review, typically. Yes. Oh. oh, God, it's even got some more oh, thoughts. Timely, right? oh, yeah. all on there. Look at that. No, oh, that's crap. ideally we'd like to get you on quarterly updates with that. that. So it's been a while since I've had it. Uh, I've got a magnifier at Okay, well, thank you for that. that. Sure. Um, okay, let's go on to city council information. Um, Jason, how about we start with you? No, sir. Tom? Oh, no, thank you. Doug? Nothing, sir. Okay. Tom? Nothing. Thank Sally? you. Nope. Thank you. Joe? Nope. Okay. Well, I don't have anything else to add. It's getting a little bit long as far as meetings go. And so, let's see, the last item on the agenda is to consider holding a closed session under Iowa Code Section 21.5.1.C. 
to discuss strategy with counsel on matters currently in litigation or in which litigation is imminent, where disclosure would likely prejudice uh, or disadvantage the city's position. Uh, do we have a motion to go into closed session? No motion. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. And I would say this, Mayor Council, this is optional. If you want to go into a closed session to talk about the litigation, the petition that was filed by the Water Department against the City of Oskaloosa, we can do that. Um, otherwise, you don't have to. I've given, briefed you just basically on everything. Um, I've passed that along through our attorney. Um, so if you want to have further discussions about that uh, pending action against the city, we can have that in closed session. So you're saying this is optional? It's up to you. Okay. It's a good time to vote no. What? <laughs> so, I, I talked with Mike personally before we came in here, so I don't know where everybody else would stand. If, if you wanted to talk together, I'd say, okay, yeah, let's go into closed session. But if it's an information thing that you can get through Mike, I have enough information Mike sent out. So, okay. but if you anybody else wants to go into closed session, I'll you know. I got an idea. How about we vote on it? All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's roll call, no, please. Yes goes in or yes, yes goes, goes in. in. No. Okay. Gates? No. Caligari? No. Jimenez? No. Moore? No. Benzet? No. Verste? No. Well, that was short. Okay. <laughs> Do we have a motion for adjournment? So move. Second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs>